Now, the Renaissance is essentially the 15th and 16th centuries. By the time you reach the late 16th century, early 17th, you're out of the Renaissance into the modern world, into specifically the beginning of modern philosophy as a distinctive uh, development. Some people date the Renaissance from 1453, but that is preposterous. You may as well say it started on high noon on a Tuesday. It's a fundamental philosophic attitude and it stretches across centuries, 15th and 16th century. Now, when Atlas Shrugged, Ayn Rand writes, quote, the road of human history was a string of blank outs over sterile stretches eroded by faith and force with only a few brief bursts of sunlight when the released energy of the men of the mind performed the wonders you gaped at, admired, and promptly extinguished again, unquote. Well, we have just come through a long, sterile stretch eroded by faith and force in our survey of the darkened Middle Ages. Now it is our pleasure to examine the achievements of one of the few bursts of sunlight in human history. Now, our pleasure is going to be diluted because we'll see the seeds of the next era of faith and force being planted again right from the beginning. We'll see the forces at work to extinguish the wonders released during this period. But let's at least look briefly at the wonders for a moment. Philosophically, the Renaissance is an age dominated by three fundamental tenets. In metaphysics, this world is fully real and intelligible to man. In epistemology, man's means of knowledge is sense experience and reason on its basis. In ethics, the goal of life is happiness on earth to be achieved by developing one's capacities and one's intellect to the fullest. All of these are Aristotelian, passed on via Aquinas. In this sense, the Renaissance is at root an Aristotelian period. Now, I said, and I say again, it was not complete. It was not self-consistent. You would be shocked at how religious they were in the Renaissance in comparison to the atheism, which is the essential undercurrent of 20th century Western civilization. They believed in God, in the Bible, the church, the afterlife, faith, revelation, the whole bit. But it was no longer the dominant cultural force. The attitude, in effect, was, yes, this is all true, but now let's get down to business. As a cultural force, mysticism died in the Renaissance. Now there's a danger in thus accepting, but just uh, uh, putting to one side all of this religion. For one thing, it prevents people from forming a rational new ethics. And the Renaissance in that respect was a chaotic, licentious, brutal, deceitful age People didn't put forth a new ethics, they simply blindly rebelled against the old one and they became sophists in reaction to Plato. That's what it amounts to. And of course, that then gives ample room for people to say, you see what happens when you leave religion. We need to reassert the old code. So I don't mean to suggest that this is a safe view. In fact, it's this view which ultimately led to the downfall of the Renaissance. Nevertheless, let us look at some of the achievements of the Renaissance. And perhaps its greatest achievement was its view of the ideal man. The ideal man was no longer St. Francis. The emphasis was on all-round development of man's faculties, on human dignity, self-respect, pride, culture, achievement. Man was regarded as a self-sufficient, responsible, independent entity, and he should fulfill his potentialities for a reason. Now, I can't resist paying a brief tribute in passing to the man who is to the Renaissance what St. Francis is to the medieval period, Leonardo da Vinci, 1452 to 1519. He is not a philosopher, only a universal genius. <laughs> but uh, needless to say, it is not the case that everyone in the Renaissance was like him any more than that everyone in the Renaissance was, in the medieval period was like St. Francis. But they're two perfect symbols to contrast two different views of life. Well, one was doing all the things I'm about to read, the other was busy drinking laundry water and plunging in the snow heaps. <laughs> Here is one commentator's description of Leonardo <clears throat> under the heading Universal Genius. <clears throat> 
Quote, strong, handsome, skilled in all athletic exercises, an accomplished musician, completely a man of the world, the friend of kings and princes, and endowed with an extraordinary personal charm and magnetism, Leonardo would by these qualities alone have satisfied the standards set for the perfect Renaissance gentleman. Clad, however, in this outward magnificence, walked probably the most universal genius of all time. I enter the brief demur of Aristotle there. And then he goes on to discuss his painting, his work in architecture, military innovations, the system of canals, his efforts to invent flying machines, submarine boats, devices for enabling man to walk on water. And then he continues, quote, Leonardo was not simply a supreme artist and inventive genius. His inventions, like his art, were incidental to a consuming curiosity regarding the structure and operations of nature. And then he goes on to detail his discoveries in the field of pure science, his investigation of the laws of perspective and chiaroscuro. He was led to the verge of the laws of inertia and acceleration, the molecular theory of liquids, the undulatory theory of light and of sound, etc., etc. There isn't even time to itemize the table of contents. And what was his attitude to the church? Quote, although he lived and died at peace with the church, Leonardo, like many another man of the Renaissance, took his Catholicism with a grain of salt. By temperament, a spectator, he was amused or disgusted rather than outraged by the abuses that were so soon to precipitate the Protestant and the Counter-Reformation. But he openly expresses his contempt of the monks, of the cultists of the Virgin and the saints, and of the sale of indulgences, discredits the story of the flood, and apparently denies the divinity of Christ. His whole attitude is well summed up in his remark that if we are doubtful of the evidence of our senses, we may well be still more doubtful of things of which there is no sensible evidence. <laughs> like the being of God and the soul and other such things about which people are always disputing and contradicting one another. And jumping to his conclusion, quote, such was Leonardo da Vinci, Courtier, athlete, musician, painter, sculptor, architect, hydraulic, civil, mechanical, military, and naval engineer, inventor, mathematician, physicist, astronomer, geologist, biologist, botanist, physiologist, philosopher, a mind forever voyaging through strange seas of thought alone, unquote. Now, when you reach a period where such a man is possible and universally admired, you are not in the medieval period anymore. <laughs> Now, I won't say anything about the artistic accomplishments of the Renaissance. Go sometime and look at a series of medieval paintings and then look at something by Michelangelo and uh, that will speak much more eloquently than any lecture I can give you. I want to say a word on the inventions of this period. It was during this period that the compound microscope was invented, the telescope, thermometer, the barometer, the air pump, Clocks uh, were greatly improved, and of course, all of this made possible the development of modern science, the precise instrumentation. A crucial invention was, of course, Gutenberg's printing press, which made the communication of ideas open to virtually everybody, as against the medieval period where you had costly monk-copied, hand-copied manuscripts the printing press was the catalyst that made thought result in action in a speed and in a manner unprecedented hitherto. It took Christianity, you see, four centuries from Jesus till the time of its dominance because it couldn't use the printing press. It uh, took Marx much less time. Of course, it wasn't only the printing press. He had all the centuries of Christianity also to rely on. But still, uh, uh, the whole intellectual process has been enormously speeded up since the printing press. And of course, television is simply a continuation of that phenomenon. It, what the printing press did is open up the possibility of education and the world of thought to everybody rather than just the rich. As to exploration, this, of course, is also the period when the surface of the earth was opened up. In 1492, as you know, Columbus discovered the new continent, America. You also know probably that during this period, Vasco da Gama rounded the Cape of Good Hope. Magellan founded an expedition which resulted in the circumnavigation of the globe. And you can't underestimate the importance of that either, the impact of it. When Columbus took off, 
Everybody told him he'd fall off the end of the world. The idea was the world was flat. If you went too far, you'd go over the end. Man was regarded as having an absolutely circumscribed position. He must not venture. According to something I read, Columbus had a map maker, and all the parts that they didn't know where it was, they simply put the word terror on the map. <laughs> His principle was, where unknown, there plays terror. And you can get an idea what the world is like. Now, it was in the Renaissance that uh, we had, for the first time, the idea of a wide open, intelligible world in the narrowest physical sense. The map came to be known, it was safe to take voyages, the world was open to man's conquest and enjoyment. Even picnics is a renaissance phenomenon, <laughs> where you go out and commune with nature and enjoy the grass as an end in itself, not because you want to give testimony to God's horticultural powers. <laughs> now, on the social-political level, with the loss of authority of the church, and that, of course, was a loss abetted by the Protestants that we'll get to in a second, you find the rise of the nation state. So it becomes meaningful to talk of France, Germany, England as again simply Christendom. Uh, national languages progressively became in fashion, and uh, that was, of course, helped by the printing press also, and gradually the monastic Latin fell into decay. The feudal order broke up, money began to be used for investment, economic profit became a goal, trade became freer, and on a comparatively worldwide basis. Now, it is not, as some alleged historians say, a period of capitalism. It is a period of absolute monarchy politically. There were still social classes, aristocracy by law, and so on. All that you can say is that the guild feudal system was definitely breaking up, and with America and the Industrial Revolution, capitalism did come into existence. But that is still several centuries away. Nevertheless, this was, the Renaissance was a comparatively freer period politically. It was less status conscious than the medieval, more individualistic. It was not the freedom of the stability of a rational constitution, but the freedom of chaos, but at least it had it to that extent. The groundwork began slowly to be laid for what would centuries later become capitalism in the United States. Let us look at the big religious development in the Renaissance, and that is the Protestant Reformation. A famous name, of course, associated with this is Luther and Calvin. I didn't copy Calvin's dates down, but he's right around Luther. Luther is 1483 to 1546. Now, you must have heard of the abuses of the Catholic Church, the tyranny of the clergy, the, uh, their amassing of wealth by exactions from the pop, uh, populace, and the sale of indulgence, promising heavenly forgiveness if only you paid enough money, and uh, that goes for your dear departed ones in the other world also. If you pay enough, you can promote them in heaven and uh, give you an idea of what went on in the medieval period and in the period in the Catholics at this time. Quote, in 1517, the following scale of fees was charged. For an indulgence, to get the hierarchy of values is also interesting. For an indulgence in a case of sodomy, 12 ducats. For sacrilege, 9 ducats. For murder, 7. <laughs> for witchcraft six, and so on down the line. Here is a sentence or two from one of Tetzel's sermons. He was the dispenser of these indulgences in a certain town. Here is a quote from one of his sermons. Quote, Do you not hear your dead parents crying out, have mercy upon us? Your dead parents. We are in sore pain, and you can set us free for a mere pittance. We have borne you. We have trained you and educated you. We have left you all our property. And you are so hard-hearted and cruel that you leave us to roast in the flames when you could so easily release us." Unquote. Now, that's what you call a religious abuse. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, there was all the hypocrisy, the reliance on pomp, and sacraments and rituals so that God, in effect, fell into the background. 
there was the blatant corruption of the papacy, Leo X in the 16th century, is supposed to have said to his brother, quote, God has given us the papacy, let us enjoy it, unquote. <laughs> now, this is what the Reformation was rebelling against, and it caught on. Monks deserted their monasteries, priests got married, churches were invaded, the images were broken, the rituals were parodied, and Christianity was irrevocably split in two between its Catholic, which was no longer Catholic, you see, because Catholic means universal, and its protesters. What was the philosophy of Protestantism? Well, it really had no organized, systematized philosophy. Its basic principle was the right of each man to read the Bible and commune with God directly and personally to understand God's message on his own and in his own way, without benefit of clergy or formalized systems of dogma, particularly without benefit of Thomism or scholasticism, which uh, Luther was violently opposed to. Now, I may say that initially the persecutions by the Protestants of dissenters were as strong, if not more so, than those of the Catholics, if you disagreed with any particular conclusion they came to. But eventually, their very lack of formalized dogma proved a liberating influence and was a significant factor contributing to freedom of thought. There were continual sects splitting off or forming new interpretations. And without a formalized dogma, you couldn't in the long run accuse these sects of heresy and sin. And if you look at Protestantism, you see the endless proliferation of sects uh, uh, as against Catholicism, which has rides uh, rigid control over what you can and can't believe. Now, you may be surprised to learn that the actual philosophy of the founders of Protestantism, people like Luther and Calvin, was a reversion to the very, very worst of the medieval views. Uh, to Augustine and beyond, uh, Luther linked the corruption of the church with its Aristotelianism, with its this-worldly attitude. He thought Aristotle was monstrous. He referred to him at one point as, quote, that damnable, proud, cunning, heathen Aristotle, unquote. He wanted a real, uncompromising religion, and he sure got it. He all but outdid Augustine in preaching that man was thoroughly depraved and sinful, absolutely dependent on God's mercy for entering heaven. There was nothing man could do on his own to earn entry into heaven. Everything was rigidly predestined, completely determined. He says somewhere, I wish the word free will had never been invented. Uh, everything is completely a function of God's plan and man is entirely at God's mercy. His doctrine was, of course, that works are unimportant. In other words, what you do and how you live are not essential, but that you have faith and believe in God and in the Gospels. Faith over works is Luther's big principle. Faith unadulterated by reason, ritual, or action was the cardinal tenet. And, of course, under the influence of Luther, Protestant theologians to this day, like Reinhold Niebuhr, for instance, are infinitely worse than Catholic theologians uh, who are still, to some extent, controlled by uh, Thomas Aquinas. Now, the best thing for Luther is to take five minutes and let him speak for himself, because he writes clearly, and whatever you say about him, he's not mealy-mouthed. In epistemology, quote, Aristotle is to theology as darkness to light, unquote. What about reason? Quote, reason is the devil's harlot and can do nothing but slander and harm all that God does and says. If outside of Christ you wish by your own thoughts to know your relation to God, you will break your neck. Thunder strikes him who examines. It is Satan 
who tells us what God is, and by doing so, he will draw you into the abyss. Therefore, keep to revelation and do not try to understand. Unquote. Pretty clear. He says somewhere else, um, I didn't bring it, but he says somewhere, whoever wants to be a Christian must tear the eyes out of his reason. And that's true. <laughs> what about his metaphysics? Well, quote, we are not masters of our actions from the beginning to the end. We are slaves. In other words, complete determinism. Free will after the fall is nothing but a word. In other words, Adam had free will, but it's gone now. Man must completely despair of himself in order to become fit to obtain the grace of Christ. This false idea of free will is a real threat to salvation and a delusion fraught with the most perilous consequences. He's a full-fledged voluntarist, as you would expect. Quote, God is inscrutable and unknowable will. Of God's will, there is no cause nor reason. There is nothing equal or superior to it. It in itself is the rule of all things. If there were for it any rule or measure or cause or reason, it wouldn't be the will of God. Not because he ought to will thus is that right which he wills. On the contrary, because he wills thus is that right which he wills. That's the state voluntarist position. What about man? Quote, by nature all of us are liars born of original sin and blindness. Well, if you're that rotten, what should you do? Quote, cursed and condemned is every kind of life lived and sought for selfish profit and good. Cursed are all works not done in love, but they are done in love when they are directed wholeheartedly, not toward selfish pleasure, profit, honor, and welfare, but toward the profit, honor, and welfare of others. What happens to your uh, body is unimportant. Quote, of what benefit is it to the soul that the body is free, is hale and hearty, that it eats, drinks, and lives as it pleases? On the other hand, what harm comes to the soul from the fact that the body is in bondage, is sick and weary, hungers, thirsts, suffers? The influence of none of these things extends to the soul, unquote. And therefore, don't worry about the body. Now, uh, politically, as you would expect, Luther is a rabid authoritarian. Just a brief quote. Fear and trust God. God has commanded that you should honor the government. Even if you despise the government for other reasons, you dare not do so any longer because of the word of God. Unquote. God, the governments are ordained by God, and your duty is absolute blind obedience to the secular power. Beyond that, Luther was a fervent German nationalist, a fervent anti-Semite, quote, from a work called On the Jews and Their Lies. Fie on you, fie on you, wherever you be, you damned Jews, <laughs> who dare to clasp this earnest, glorious, consoling word of God to your maggoty, mortal, miserly belly. <laughs> and are not ashamed to display your greed so openly, unquote. In short, Luther is a really nice guy, as you say. <laughs> Calvin is just as nice. <laughs> now, the ultimate net result of all this, paradoxically, was nevertheless positive. <laughs> Because the lack of a formalized dogma, the emphasis on the liberty of the individual conscience, uh, was enormously anti-authoritarian. It broke up the monopoly of the Catholic Church, and Protestantism could never establish an equivalent monopoly. Moreover, the philosophy of Protestantism, and particularly its morality, is so extreme, so anti-reason, so anti-life, that it simply can't be lived by. And, of course, the emphasis on faith over works 
suggests you don't have to live by it. It's not how you live, it's what your faith is that counts. So that the effect of Protestantism was to separate religion and life. Aquinas had tried to reconcile reason and religion so that you could actually practice religion here on earth. Protestantism separated the two so far that you simply had to live your life without much reference to religion and then go to church on Sundays. And the result is that although Protestantism philosophically is much worse than Catholicism, given Aquinas, Protestant countries are generally more this earth, more independent, more rational, and more productive than Catholic countries. And so you have England, United States, Germany, for instance, as against Italy, Spain, South America. France, I may say, is untypical in this respect. Well, so much for Luther. Uh, you see that Hitler knew perfectly well what he was doing when he made Luther's birthday an official Nazi holiday. All right, let us continue with the Renaissance. Our theme now is the rediscovery of antiquity. Just as the spatial boundaries on Earth were opened up, so were the frontiers of time opened up. In the Dark Ages, as you know, men in the West were ignorant of the ancient world and its achievements. By the time of the Renaissance, antiquity was rediscovered in all of its glory. They unearthed the manuscripts of the pagans, they translated them, Virtually everything we have today came to be known during the Renaissance. And almost all the schools of the ancient world flourished again. There was the standard controversies between the Aristotelians, the Platonists, the Neoplatonists, the Pythagoreans, the Atomists, the Epicureans, the Stoics, the Sophists, the Skeptics. For the first 100, 150, even 200 years of the modern world, until the 17th century, there was nothing new philosophically. That period consists of the revival of Greek philosophies and the supplanting of the medieval tradition. Sometimes put, it's the period when the West went to school for two centuries to the schools of ancient Greece, relearning what was known in the ancient world. Of course, there were still theologians and scholastics in abundance, but their time was progressively up. <laughs> Now, such philosophy as there was during the Renaissance, you may be surprised to learn, was Platonism in one form or another. There was every kind of view that the world is the body of God, pantheism, Neoplatonism, excessive mysticism, a lot of alchemy, magic. It was, in effect, an eclectic, chaotic period intellectually with a pronounced bent toward Platonism. Now, why? The answer is a tragic, tragic irony. Aristotle was identified as the philosopher of the scholastics, the philosopher of the Catholic Church, owing, of course, to the scholastics' appropriation of him. And consequently, the rebellion against the Church and against Catholicism took the form of a rebellion against Aristotle, whom everybody, just about, not everybody, but most people, package dealed with the Church. And this is one of the most tragic ironies in history, from which we are still suffering to this day. And will it, ex it will explain to you why superficial commentators refer to the Renaissance as the period in which Platonism rules and Aristotle is supplanted. Poets had the effrontery to write poems on the hero who slayed the tyrant Aristotle, etc., now, this package deal was deliberately fostered by the church. They would sometimes take specific theories from Aristotle's physics, not his philosophy, but his physics. Theories which Aristotle would have been the first to abandon if he'd seen the evidence against them. And then the church or the scholastics would refuse to consider the evidence, blindly adhere to Aristotle's specific scientific theories in the face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary, and proceed to persecute, torture, and even kill the philosophers and scientists of the period, quote, in the name of Aristotle. Many of the deaths of the Inquisition were perpetrated in the name of Aristotelianism. Now, for instance, Pomponazzi, who was a good Aristotelian of the period, had a disciple, Vanini, who was burned at the stake. Giordano Bruno preached that the earth is not at the center of the uh, heavens. He was burned at the stake. Campanella, a very strongly religious, mystical Platonist, uh, 
was set, sentenced to 27 years in jail. Galileo, of course, as you know, was forced to recant his views. It was not just the specific incorrect uh, scientific or astronomical theories of Aristotle, moreover, that the church did this with. The philosophic ideas of Aristotle <clears throat> were thoroughly distorted to mean something quite different from what Aristotle had meant, and then used allegedly in the name of Aristotle to fight the scientists and the independent thinkers. For instance, to give you one example, you remember Aristotle had said there are self-evident axioms. But he had gone on to say that these must be carefully defined based on sensory evidence, limited to those which you can prove objectively are self-evident, and so on. Now, in the hands of many church Aristotelians, not the Thomists, of course, who are much more sophisticated, but in the hands of many of these church Aristotelians, it became the idea we can start from any premises which appeal to us and erect floating systems regardless of observational evidence. And if one of these systems is opposed by factual evidence, so much the worse for the evidence. Now, you have no idea the mentalities at work here. For instance, when Galileo discovered the four moons of Jupiter, prior to that there had only been five planets, the sun and the moon, in other words, seven heavenly bodies, not counting the stars. Now, seven, of course, as you know, is a sacred number. The Sabbath is the seventh day. Candlesticks have seven branches. There are seven major churches in Asia, and so on. Now, some of these people refuse to look through the telescope. Here's a quote from a professor of philosophy at Padua, who refused to look through Galileo's telescope to see the satellites of Jupiter. Here's what he said, quote, There are seven windows given to animals in the domicile of the head. Two eyes, two nostrils, a mouth, two ears. Seven. From this and many other similarities in nature, such as the seven metals, etc., which it would be tedious to enumerate, we gather that the number of planets is necessarily seven. Moreover, these alleged satellites of Jupiter are invisible to the naked eye, get the progression here, and therefore can exercise no influence on the earth, and therefore would be useless, and therefore do not exist. <laughs> Besides, from the earliest times, men have adopted the division of the week into seven days and have named them after the seven planets. Now, if we increase the number of planets, this whole and beautiful system falls to the ground." <laughs> Unquote. Now, when this sort of thing passes for Aristotelianism, it is no wonder that there is a rebellion. But then it's not a rebellion against Aristotle, regardless of what it's called. Now, during the Renaissance, this rebellion took two predominant forms. One trend, as I already mentioned, was the Platonist trend. Nothing original at all, just eclectic mystical Platonists. The second was the rebellion of the scientists. The men who were on the premise, down with books, systems, theories, whether Aristotelian, Platonist, or any other. Let us go to the facts. As they put it, let us study the book of nature, not the books of men. Let us sweep aside all the traditional views and go to the things themselves for an unprejudiced examination of their character by observation and unaided reason. Let's start from scratch, scrap everything and found philosophy and science once and for all on firm foundations. Now, of course, the men of science, in spite of themselves, were influenced by philosophy. They couldn't escape it in part insofar as they were truly scientists by Aristotle, but of course also in part, unfortunately, by Plato and Platonism, which was everywhere in the atmosphere. Now these two trends interacted. The Platonists had to make terms with science, and their great attempt was Descartes next week. As for the scientists, I'm sorry I can't call them Aristotelians, because they were mixed from the beginning, and they slowly, gradually merged into the sophist school centuries later. That is to say, the philosophers of science, the working scientists, not so badly. Why did the forces of reason and science not wipe out Christianity entirely? They did, but it takes time. You cannot have, you cannot have a thousand years <laughs> 
in which something is regarded as a self-evident axiom and everything is integrated around it, every human circuit and concern and premise, and expect that because you're challenged the base, the rest is all simply going to obliterate. This is where the fact that human beings are not Aquinas as angels comes into the picture. They have to grasp in each new concrete, oh yes, that's Christianity and I've rejected that. And oh yes, this is and I've rejected that. And that It doesn't take as long to undo as it did to build, but it's very similar to the process by which you recover from a neurosis. If it takes you 20 years to build up a good-sized neurosis, it might take you now, Dr. Blumenthal won't allow me to give a time, but it would take you, let us say, several years to overcome it. Not as long as to build it up, but on the other hand, you may hear the most brilliant lecture and be intellectually convinced of what's wrong with your neurosis, but you have to uproot it one application at a time until you begin to automatize the new viewpoint. Now mankind as a whole functions the same way. Now it's very rapid. Five centuries only, essentially, since the Renaissance. And already the latest wing in Christianity is proclaiming atheism. You know, God is dead as a new school of Protestant theology. Now religion is gone now. There's a lot of other bad things and there's a lot of bad legacies of religion, but religion is not only not a dominant force, it is not even a non-dominant force today. In the West, for practical purposes, atheism rules. Uh, it's not even controversial anymore. You have, to, you have to go out of your way in the Bible Belt to find somebody who will even argue for it. Uh, and in that sense, Christianity has gone. I mean, the buildings are still around, but, you know, that's about it. You can't have an ahistorical view, you know, as though all of mankind sits down, reads Aquinas, and says, okay, let's start over. It just doesn't work that way. <laughs>